Today is a great day, and it's exciting because I'm being joined, of course, by Bishop Mark Brown. You like Bishop? Sure. Okay, Brother Mark Brown, he's youth president to South Dakota, and uh, he's been here for youth camp in our district, and he's gracious enough, been gracious enough to sit down with me for a traffic talk. Thank you so much for joining me, bro. Thank you, man. It's Getting to be on the road with you in Canada. Well, the first question that I'll, I'll just start this interview off right off the bat, uh, who is your favorite preacher in our movement? Favorite preacher? Uh, there's there's a lot out there, but some of the ones I really enjoy listening to would be uh, Wayne Huntley, Jeff Arnold, Raymond Woodward, Paul Mooney. Um, that's that's an that's a good number right there. But those are some of my favorite people to listen. To. I can listen to all day, every day. Now it doesn't have to be by one of them, but do you have like one sermon that? Uh, has spoken to you the most, resonated the most with your, in your spirit over the years? Uh, two most memorable ones for me is one, what got me, you know, living for God was my pastor, Terry Cox, preached a sermon, Remember the Amalekites, and uh, boy, he, he dangled me over hell, and uh, I, I just got the fear of God in me that day forward, and I've, I've taken my walk with God serious after that. The other one, um, when I was in the church and we were in our church plant that we started, um, I was at a very low point. We were losing everybody that we worked for. And I was at a Because of Times and Jeff Arnold preached the Lord of what's left. And the premise of that was basically after everything's gone, what remains is what God's going to use to build the revival in the kingdom. And I needed that at that point, And it means a lot to me. I've listened to that so many times. Um, I know that you're a coffee aficionado uh, from just talking to you. I kind of gathered that. And so being that kind of uh, aficionado, what is your favorite coffee place, um, maybe local, and then if you had a choice around the world, and what's your drink of choice? Um, well, like for an everyday accessibility that I have in my local town, it, it's it's going to be Starbucks. Um but I love, I love independent coffee shops that are serious about what they do. Just because it's independent doesn't mean it's good. For Starbucks itself, I'm, a go-to drink is straight black coffee or straight espresso. Uh, on their regular coffee lineup, it'd be Sumatra. I love the earthy herbal notes. Uh, I like that full body taste. It's a beautiful coffee. Um, but my favorite from Starbucks would be an Ethiopia Kanga or an Arabian Mocha Sanani. But those are Starbucks reserves. It's not an everyday offering. Uh, it's, it's the way to go. For going out, I haven't been to every place I'd like to to try to some, try some elite, well-known independent coffee shops. But one place I'm able to semi have access to when I go to St. Louis, they have uh, one outside of the city called Sump Sump's Coffee. That's pretty legit, bro. It, it's it's legit. My my most unique coffee I've ever had though was Kopi Luwak. I've been privileged to have it twice. I've never been able to pay for it, but by the grace of God, I've been given it, someone's given it to me twice, three ounces of it, and three ounces of this coffee is $90, and it's the coffee that a civet, which is a cat-like, raccoon, monkey-like looking creature, uh, eats coffee cherries, it passes through it, and then locals harvest the droppings, get the coffee pit, pit and they, the bean, and they roast it, and that has been a very unique cup, very delicious, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, shared it with our congregation, um, but I've only had that experience twice. Is it actually good? Does it? Is there any hint of poo in the coffee? Uh, I thought poo poo plata. No, it's um, no, it doesn't taste like poop at all. It's roasted, so I get you know, it's roasted out. It's clean. I would never pay for it though. I would never pay for it, but um, it is worth it if you have the opportunity. That's that's cool. In church, what is your go-to dance move when you start feeling the? The spirit moving. Well, man, it's only if I'm really feeling the Shekinah, the real deal, you know. And, oh, yeah. and you know, I, I get laid out in the spirit, and I come back too, you know, after the third heaven. I, I, I'm reminded of a dance move from my super uber carnal days when I was lost. And there's a man named Vanilla Ice who could thread the needle. <laughs> With his footwork, he would do a little footwork. He'd grab his left foot, jump in the air. His right foot would extend and go through on the other side and land. But that's only if I'm really feeling it. Okay. Uh, nice. I need to try that one. 
you will be blessed and highly flavored of the Lord. So when you went to Watertown to, to start the church there, did you have like this, this plan in place um, or did you just kind of go in letting the Lord lead you? And if you did have a plan, how did that shift and change when you actually got on the ground? I, I had no plan at all. We had no idea what we were getting into. Um, I'm originally from Southside Chicago, and the Lord spoke to us. And immediately after Bible college, we were 22, we went out and just went for it. And uh, there was pros and cons to that. Uh, you know, if I probably would have overanalyzed it and really thought it out, I probably wouldn't have went. Um, <laughs> so I just stepped out by faith. I obeyed God at the moment. And um, but as things began to progress, we realized, you know, we we need to start kind of. Uh, structuring, organizing, figure out how we're doing this, how we're going about with some methods and routines. But originally, we just stepped out. Okay. So now, looking back, uh, to somebody that maybe is currently looking to start a church or is planning a church currently, any tips that you would give them? I say a number of things. One, you know, first is to get a yes from God and a yes from your pastor. If you have those two yeses, you could do anything. Like, I wouldn't redo my life over my process because that's, I am who I am because of, of that process. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of things I would do differently, you know, to some extent, but overall I wouldn't change what I've done. But we do plan on starting more churches, and I am for a, a, a team method approach. I really like the concept of preview services, um, things like that. I don't ever feel for anyone that doesn't go out and do something there if they're not doing something currently right now. You know, if you're not teaching Bible studies now, if you're not praying daily now, if you're not reading your Bible daily now, you're not going to survive by yourself pioneering your work. You're not just going to randomly turn into someone, you know, super spiritual, like, oh, man, now I'm a pastor or a church planner. Right. Um, you, you actually have to be strong spiritually and sound in the doctrine now. And if you can't teach someone through a Bible study of repentance, Jesus name, baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost, and a lifestyle of holiness. If you can't go through that with somebody before you go out to start a work, you're going to have a very tough time. To somebody who currently goes to church, loves God, wants to do good, but they struggle with sin, um, what would you say is the best way or some good tips to break that sin cycle in their life? Well, any, any sin that we're struggling with we're dealing with you know the bible says in in james chapter 1 i believe it's verses 13 through 16 it says that you know let no man say when he's tempted i am tempted of god for god cannot be tempted with evil but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and so whatever you're struggling with you got to take ownership of it responsibility like this is my problem i i'm i'm producing this and so i tie a lot of sin problems to our own personal diets uh, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 22, the light of the body is the eye. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 12, uh, 34 through 37, talking about from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so the two main ports for someone's heart and soul is the ears and the eyes. And so more than likely, whatever you're struggling with is what you're exposing your eyes to and your ears to. And I would begin to explore, you know, if you're struggling with sexual lust, what are you watching? If you're struggling with anger or cursing, uh, I'd question, what are you listening to? Is it aggressive, that kind of music, you know, anger, rebellion? And uh, if you can correct your diet, uh, you can actually, you know, get your heart right with God. And um, I also would recommend get, get your pastor, get your youth pastor involved, because uh, very rarely does anyone ever succeed by themselves. I'm, I'm a strong proponent or advocate for accountability and that has helped me what is one moment with God that you will never ever forget there's a number maybe one of the most important for me aside from getting right with God was I remember I was at Indiana Bible College and I was getting aggravated you know they kept teaching on like doctrine you know core doctrines in our movement you know baptism and, and the Holy Ghost holiness and I'm like come on I can't I came to Bible college to learn something else. You know, I want some deeper things or whatever. And so I was getting annoyed, and there was this conference going on uh, that Burr Mooney put on called Steadfast, and it was just basically doctrine. And I'm like, this is the most boring 
conference in the world. This is how I was thinking at the time. And all of a sudden, this old guy, I don't even know who he is. I don't know if he's alive. I don't know where he's at, where he's from. His name was, I just remember his name was McCool. Old, wiry man. And he had a chair up there, and he had an actual whip. And he started cracking the whip. And I don't remember even what he was saying. I'm just like, this guy's crazy. But then he made this point, and this is all I can remember from the sermon, was that the Apostle Paul was preaching a message. They, they dragged him out of town after miracle signs and wonders, and they stoned him to death. And they walked away and left him dead. And he said that he got up out of that pile of rocks, went back into that city, and preached the exact same message. And at that moment, I mean, boom! Oh, the, the, the Holy Ghost hit me and saying, that's why you need to know what you believe. Are you, are you persuaded about what you believe so much that at the ultimate point of rejection, you can get back up go to the same city and preach the same thing. And I told God, no, I'm not there. And I found a place to pray. And I literally, I don't know how many hours, it's not boasting, but I literally locked myself away for hours weeping about, you know, just the doctrine. I, I want revelation. And I was on a pursuit. I wanted revelation from God. And that's something I think also is missing in our generation and younger is I don't think a lot of people have an actual revelation of the born again message and holiness and oneness of God. It's just been passed down to them and we're regurgitating. And I'm telling you, I, you can't shake me from this because I've ha I could take you to the places I, I saw Jesus name baptism for the first time for revelation for myself and oneness of God and down the road. You just can't shake me, man. Yeah. I, I've, I've had my revelation from God, not from man. That's powerful. Uh, what is the funniest or strangest thing that you've seen in your travels or maybe in your uh, your escapades of planning a church? The funniest or strangest thing you've ever seen? Well, just like, just say the first person, for example, that I baptized, I, I think it's kind of silly, was uh, this lady wanted to be baptized, I was pumped up, went to baptizers me mirror, is her first convert. And I, we didn't have a baptistry, so I got a horse trough. And I'm carrying that thing on my back up the steps in the church. I look like an ant with a loaf of bread on my back. Set the thing down. There's a water spigot there. We're in the middle of January, and it's negative 30 in, in South Dakota. It, that's not wind chill. It's just negative 30. Yeah. And I turn it on, and it's like, thunk, 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 thunk. It's just like an ice machine. Uh. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, I, I can't deep freeze this girl in Jesus' name. Yeah. So I was like, hey, just give me a little time. I'll, I'll let's, Tomorrow, let's baptize you tomorrow at church. And she goes, okay. So I woke up at five in the morning and I got all the pots and pans I could gather, filled them up with the water, set them on the stove. And from five o'clock to 10 o'clock when service started, I was boiling water, carrying up pot by pot, dumping it in there. So when church was about to start, <laughs> the horse trough has steam coming out of it. And so instead of deep freezing her in Jesus' name, I steeped her in Jesus' name like a tea bag. <laughs> Here's a question. Most times that I've seen you preach, you wear a black suit, a white shirt, and a black tie. And uh, is there a reason for that? Is that just uh, I like penguins. Preference? Yeah, okay. Penguins are, no. I, uh, when I went to Bible college, I've never been into fashion or anything like that. Uh, I never seen so many guys concerned about how they looked, how they dressed. And literally, I mean, every day you had to wear a suit, tie, all that kind of stuff to the classes. And people, man, I, I never knew there's all these ways to tie your tie. It mattered how many buttons were on your suit, how your pants fit, where the crease was. Never heard any of that stuff. And so, like, I started getting conscious about it because I was definitely not fitting. So I started trying to, you know, fit. And I started trying to configure my outfit, if you will. And all of a sudden, like, here I am, like, I'm, it's 30 minutes I'm getting ready for church. Now, 40 minutes I'm getting, you know, I'm trying to, I'm like, this is ridiculous. And, um, and I, I literally started feeling convicted about vanity and pride and showing out and uh, being concerned about what people thought, how I looked at church or wherever. And so I gave all my, my clothes, my suits, my outfits and stuff to, to some people that didn't have as much or as nice or whatever. And I started from scratch with just a white shirt, black suit. And, um, and so since then, it's just something personally for me to keep me in check. I don't preach it to anyone. I don't teach it to anyone else. 
but when I'm when I go out and I minister at our at our church or another church, I'm in a black suit, white tie, or white black tie and white shirt. I mean, I'm ready for church in less than five minutes. And that's that is that is worth it right there, and that's that's great, man. I like that. Finally, bro, is there anything that you'd like to share with this generation of apostolic young people? You know, one anything burning on your on your heart that you just like to get out there? Oh, man, uh, that's a loaded question. I've been exposed to a number of young people and young ministers that that would like to to do something great for God, but uh, they have so many hang-ups from the past thinking that they can't because of their past. In Exodus chapter 28, God and Moses are talking, and they're planning out Aaron's future, making his holy garments, all this stuff on top of Mount Sinai. And while God's planning at the base of the mountain, Aaron's making a golden calf and getting all of them saying, Behold, this is your God. And they're worshiping naked. They're doing detestable things. And I I think of Romans 5, 8. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And so even though we have sinned, even though we've done bad things, God has a plan. God has a purpose. And he could pick you up from your mistakes. And that's what he did with Aaron. And if he could do it with Aaron in the Old Testament, and still place him in the Levitical priesthood as the high priest after making a false god, a false idol. What can the blood of Jesus do for us in the New Testament? He could still place you in the ministry. And I was 18 years old, and God took my messed up, backslidden state, spitting in God's face, and within four years, he made me a church planner. That is only by the grace of God, and that is available for everyone. And there's just a second side note. It would be be yourself. And that's a very common cliche term we hear people say. And everyone says that. But the reality is, and I think you would maybe agree with this, there's very few individual ministers that really stand out as unique. Everyone preaches the same. It's the style's the same. The, the address is the same. God's just looking for unique people. Don't try to be like anyone else. You don't have to be popular, cool, funny, anything. Just be you. And I, I love individuality in a pulpit. Just transparency and realness. And we need more of that. Amen. Well, bro, that's, uh, I think that's about it. So thank you so much again for joining me for, for Traffic Talk. We're going to wrap it up today. Thanks so much for watching it. Be sure to subscribe to the Traffic Talk channel. And we'll be posting more videos very, very soon. Have a great day. Thanks again. We love you.